Thank you. We could hardly have imagined a more auspicious beginning to our annual series of Glennon Philosophy Lectures than to begin with Dr. Peter Kreeft, Professor of Philosophy at Boston College and at uh, King's College in New York's Empire State Building. Untold numbers of readers, including no doubt many of y'all, know Dr. Kreeft as the author of 67 books at last count, Master of the Dialogue, Trenchant Cultural Critic, and Guide to the Clear Understanding of Philosophical and Theological Complexities. He has written and written well on almost every imaginable subject, including, for example, abortion, relativism, angels, Thomistic philosophy, prayer, apologetics, ecumenism, scripture, and passionately on surfing. He is, it's true, you can ask him about it. He is famous for his dialogues, but also writes both sparkling prose and more recently novels and scholastic disputations. I'm sure we all have our favorites among his works. I would probably have to put three philosophies of life at the top of my list, and I'm sure our logic students would put Socratic logic toward the top of theirs, right? <laughs> But in every case, his work is ultimately aimed at the beatitude of his hearers. Dr. Kreef's writing and lectures address the intellect, but never forget the heart, much like the work of Blaise Pascal, the subject of one of Dr. Kreef's best books and of his talk today. But even beyond all these marks of success, we are glad to begin with Dr. Kreef because he is a, a living example of a truth close to the heart of Glennon College. Clear thinking and sound philosophy can help us both to understand the gospel we proclaim and to bring others to a personal encounter with our living Lord through that proclamation. Please join me in welcoming to the first annual John Cardinal Glennon Lecture, Dr. Peter Craig. I was very glad to be assigned the topic, Blaise Pascal and the New Evangelization. Because when I teach Pascal in my philosophy classes at Boston College, I get a result, uh, an effect that I get from nobody else. Augustine comes the closest. The students not only pay attention, they get very quiet. They even stop breathing for a few minutes. <laughs> And you'll notice when your attention is really riveted by something, you, you don't breathe for a few minutes. Uh, Pascal is, I think, the single most effective apologist uh, that I know. And we certainly need his help because we're living in mission territory. Many of you have heard the organization Focus, they're missionaries, and they go to uh, some of the most dark and benighted places in the world. They specialize in Catholic colleges. <laughs> Kierkegaard defined his life's vocation as uh, the job of smuggling Christianity back into Christendom. Well, Pascal is good for that. What the church calls the new evangelization uh, is basically uh, re-evangelizing what used to be called Christendom and then was called Western civilization and now is called pretty much anything you want. Maybe uh, apostate Christendom would be a good name for it. What's new about the new evangelization is not a new gospel. There is no new gospel. Uh, there's no new evangel in the new evangelization, but there is a new isation in the new evangelization. And what's new about that, of course, is first of all where the need is, and that's right here. Uh, but what is the need? Well, the need is, of course, a crisis of faith. Uh, from anybody's point of view, neutral, believing, or unbelieving, the major event in the history of the world for the past 500 years has been the decline of the influence of religious faith on Western civilization. What are its causes? I think there are four main causes 
And I think Pascal can help us to address each of these causes. The first cause is a crisis of reason. You can't have faith unless you have reason, just as you can't have crops unless you have fertilized ground. And for the last 500 years, the mainline story in the history of Western philosophy is the crisis of reason. What was assumed in almost all ancient and medieval philosophy, except for the sophists, is that you can trust reason and then go and build your systems with it. People don't do that anymore. They reflect on whether reason is any good and why. Is it valid? A second crisis is a crisis of morality. We are not just skeptics about reason, we're skeptics about morality. We're moral skeptics. We're living in the first civilization in the history of the world, the majority of whose intellectuals no longer believe in anything like a natural moral law. This is a spectacular change. Cultures have argued a lot about what's in the moral law, what you emphasize in it, uh, what's right and what's wrong, but no culture has ever massively denied the objective existence of right and wrong. We are living in history's most radical experiment, and there are only three possible futures for that culture and that civilization. Either we will repent of our moral skepticism and moral relativism and return to moral wisdom and quite possibly flourish, or we will persist <clears throat> in our relativism and since no culture has ever been healthy without uh, a set of moral absolutes, we will die. Or else, thirdly, we will disprove one of history's most certain laws, that without morality, uh, a culture cannot flourish. C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man, one of the most prophetic books of the 20th century, says that there is something that distinguishes modern so-called wisdom from the wisdom of all other previous cultures. For all of our ancestors, the cardinal problem of human life was how to conform the human soul and human life to objective reality. And objective reality included a moral law. And the most important answer to that question then was wisdom and virtue and self-discipline. For, for our culture, the fundamental problem of human life is how to subdue objective reality to the wishes of man. And the answer is science and technology. It's a new summum bonum. Well, that's obviously a second crisis. Technology itself offers us a third crisis because since our lives are surrounded by technology rather than by nature, we have developed a new meaning to the very word nature. People no longer understand the meaning of the word natural law. There's nothing that's natural. Everything is artificial. The natural law to most people today simply means the way nature works, birds and bees and flowers and trees. That's not the meaning of nature in pre-modern philosophy. Nature is a real force <clears throat> that guides the behavior of things. You can tell <clears throat> the nature of a thing by observing its action. But that's not a, <clears throat> a scientific notion. That's the notion of final causality or teleology or purpose. And so we have this crisis of a technology which eliminates our understanding of nature, and it also largely eliminates human unhappiness. Technology has been wonderfully successful in making us happy and relieving most of the pain in our lives. I read one estimate that said that the average person today can expect to experience in an entire lifetime approximately the same amount of physical pain as someone in the high middle ages experienced every month. Well, that means that we're not as miserable as our ancestors, and that's certainly progress. However, Pascal's whole apologetics, his whole strategy in the Pensees, is to start with human misery as the problem, or at least as the symptom of the problem. 
If you have no symptoms, you may not realize you're sick. Physical symptoms are usually the effects of some more deep underlying and invisible cause. And we're still just as sick, we just don't have the symptoms anymore. Uh, he was going to outline the pensées before God in his mercy struck him dead before he turned 40 so that he couldn't spoil these wonderful notes and make them into some artificial dull book. <laughs> he, he has hints as to what the book was going to be like and the outline was two main points. Man's wretchedness without God, man's happiness with God. In other words, the bad news and the good news. That's basically the gospel. Well, the main reason the gospel is not heard today is not because people don't believe in good news. They believe in all sorts of good news. They're very naive. Uh, they don't believe in the bad news. Sin and salvation, two key terms of the gospel. Sin is the bad news, salvation is the good news. But if you don't believe in sin, salvation is meaningless. What does Jesus save you from? Politically incorrect opinions? Bad social work? Uh, if I offered you the good news of a free quarter of a million dollar worth quadruple bypass heart transplant, uh, would you say, great, take me to the hospital? Of course not, because you don't think you need it. In ancient times, the gospel was resisted as being much too good to be true. Everybody knew that the first <clears throat> truth, the bad news, was true. Of course we were wretched. But was there a way out? It was the good news that was controversial. Today it's exactly the opposite. We have to preach the bad news first before we can get a hearing for the good news. But people don't want to hear the bad news. What is, what is our fundamental liturgical formula when we greet each other? How are you? And what's the answer? Fine. No matter what, you're fine. You, you can't admit that you're not fine. I mean, your dog may just have died, your mother-in-law came to live with you for the rest of your life, and the IRS is auditing you, but you're fine. That's our faith. We are full of what Pascal calls diversions. We have a lot of elephants in our living room, sin, death, misery, and we can't get rid of them, but we can cover them up with a million mice. And those are the many diversions in our life. And technology gives us those diversions. All right, there is a fourth crisis that Pascal also addresses. And that's a crisis that's more inward. It's a crisis of passion. We don't have spines anymore. We're very nice. Uh, we have flesh. We're compassionate, we're soft, we're better than our ancestors at the soft virtues. Mercy, forgiveness, compassion, empathy. But we're certainly not as good as our ancestors at the hard virtues, the tough virtues. Courage, honesty, chastity. We're wimps. Pascal sees these last two things, diversion and indifference, as our two main defenses against the truth, especially the truth of the gospel. So I'd like to talk about these four crises, the skepticism of reason, the skepticism of morality, uh, diversions, and indifference, and how Pascal can help us to address all four of these crises. The crisis of reason stems more from, I think, Descartes than anyone else, which is rather surprising because Descartes is a rationalist and has a very high and optimistic view of reason. But reason is narrowed in Descartes' philosophy. It's not all that distinguishes man from the beast. It means simply scientific method reasoning. He thought that if you, if you narrowed reason uh, in philosophy, as we have narrowed it in science, to a kind of laser beam, it becomes more to more efficient, as laser light can do things that ordinary light can't. But there's a price you pay for that. You start with ordinary light, which is like a floodlight, and then you concentrate it and make it a spotlight, and that's an advantage. And then you concentrate it even more and make it laser light, and that's an advantage too. But if you forget where you started from, if you forget the big picture, 
then you might have science but not wisdom. Then you might have efficiency but not profundity. Once you start with that narrowed meaning of reason, uh, the result is going to be skepticism. That's paradoxical because what Descartes did to reason was strengthen it, but without the big picture around it to support it, it did in fact result in the history of modern philosophy in the skepticism of David Hume, who is probably more influential than, than anyone else. Uh, every time I meet someone who's studying philosophy in a, a non-Catholic university, I always say, who's your favorite philosopher? And by far, the most common answer is Hume, who is the most serious skeptic in the history of philosophy, probably. Once reason is reduced to something merely empirical and merely mathematical, uh, there's almost nothing left. And the only way to rehabilitate reason in the face of that is Kant's way, according to which reason is no longer the perception of things in themselves or objective reality, but it's rather uh, the invention of consciousness to structure reality. So that all the structure, all the form, all the order, all the meaning, all the logos that we find is our own. Like the cartoon of the two shipwrecked sailors on this little desert island, uh, there's only one palm tree and their clothes are ragged, uh, and a message in a bottle washes up, and hope appears on their face, and one reads the message, and the hope disappears from their face as he reads the message, it's only from us. All the meaning, all the order, all the truth that we seem to discover is really only what we've invented. Well, that's an even deeper crisis of reason. And then when you get to Hegel, reason itself becomes historically relative. Truth itself evolves through history, and so does God. And then you subtract the spiritual and the divine from that, and you get Marxism. Reason is a, a, a historical economic development. It's, it, it's essentially ideological. And then you add Freud and reason becomes nothing but rationalizing. We are it, we are desire. And the superego and its standards are, are basically an illusion, a facade. So all reason is rationalizing, of course, except that little bit of reasoning. And then in Darwin, reason becomes simply uh, nature's trick for pragmatic survival. There's nothing sanctioned about it. There's nothing authoritative about it. It's just what works. Pascal, before all these developments, except for Descartes, who was a contemporary of Descartes, uh, foresaw them and realized that reason was not going to be able to do what Descartes thought it could do. Descartes began with universal doubt. That is a very good beginning for a scientist. The scientific method begins with universal doubt. I think probably the, the main reason the Middle Ages weren't very good at science was not because they weren't interested, they were fascinated. It's because they didn't have a tough-minded enough scientific method. They began not with doubt, but with faith. Aristotle, the greatest of all scientists, says this, it's probably true, let's assume that it's true, and then go on from there. Well, people should indeed be treated as innocent until proven guilty, but when you're doing science, ideas have to be treated as guilty until proven innocent. So Descartes says, since this new scientific method works so well in all the other sciences, let's apply it to philosophy. So let's begin by doubting absolutely everything. Let us doubt even reason itself. Reason has often misled us. Sometimes you make simple mistakes in arithmetic in, in counting, counting up your checkbook balance. And reason has often misled us uh, when we use it to understand sense data. Uh, there are optical illusions that we can be deceived by. The sun and the moon look the same size, but they're not. Uh, Reason often deceives us in our dreams. We think we're awake and we're not. And there's nothing that can't be put into a dream that 
can be put into reality. So how do you know you're not dreaming now? Finally, he goes so far as to say, how do you know you're not being hypnotized by the devil? How do you know there's not a, a, an evil spirit, much more intelligent and powerful than you are, you are, who is putting all these ideas and experiences into your mind right now? Well, that's about the seri most serious doubt any philosopher ever had. And Descartes thought he had an answer to it. Pascal disagrees. <clears throat> he writes in Ponce number <clears throat> 131, The strongest of the arguments for skepticism <clears throat> is that we cannot be sure that the principles of reason itself, he's thinking of something like the law of non-contradiction, are true, except through some natural intuition of our mind. <clears throat> now this natural intuition affords no proof that they're true, for there is no certainty apart from faith as to whether man was created by a good God or by an evil demon or just by chance. So it is a matter of doubt, depending on the origin of our minds, whether our mind's innate principles are true, false, or uncertain. Your brain is like a computer in many ways. Would you trust a computer that was programmed by a lying, deceiving mind? Of course not. How about by blind chance, by somebody throwing a bag of marbles at the keyboard? No only if the computer is programmed by a wise and trustable mind do you trust the computer well why do you trust your brain then was it programmed simply by random chance evolution or perhaps by an evil spirit that you can't trust only if god designed your mind can you trust it but how do you know there's a god by your mind oops recalculating that's arguing in a circle. You use reason to prove God, and you use God to prove reason. Descartes apparently didn't see that circle. Pascal is more skeptical than Descartes, and that's why he has a better notion of reason than Descartes does. He goes on, moreover, no one can be sure, apart from faith, whether he is sleeping or waking, because when we are asleep, we are just as firmly convinced that we are awake as we are now. And as we sometimes dream that we are dreaming, piling up one dream on top of another, is it not possible that this part of our life, which we call waking life, is itself only a dream, onto which other dreams are grafted, and from which perhaps we shall awake only when we die? What then shall we do if reason is in crisis to bring people to the faith? How can you evangelize in the face of such skepticism? Pascal's answer is very simple. Reason isn't the only organ that we have that perceives the truth. There are three eyes that we have, the outer eye of the body, the inner eye of the mind, and the inner eye of the heart. What Pascal means by the heart is not just feeling or emotion or sentiment. He means by the heart what the Bible means by the heart, the center of the soul, that which pumps life blood to the rest of the soul. Probably the most famous uh, of all the pensées is the heart has its reasons which the reason does not know. People often quote that and mean exactly the opposite of what it says, namely that the heart feels and feeling is better than thinking. That's not what it says. It says the heart has reasons. It's a kind of deeper reasoning. You can know more certainly with the heart than you can with the head. We know the truth, Pascal says, not only through our reason, but also through our heart. It is through the heart that we know first principles. How do you know the law of non-contradiction? How do you know that a thing is not what it isn't? Prove that by logic. 
You can't. Any proof presupposes that principle. So any proof argues in a circle, begs the question. And yet you can't doubt that. Why? Is, is that a perception of what is true? It, is there any exception in your experience to that rule? Have you ever seen something be what it isn't? No. Well, take another principle that's almost as certain and as indubitable. Uh, how do you know that something can't come into existence for no reason at all? How do you know that every change requires a cause? How do you know that you won't see a large blue rabbit suddenly appear on my head and jump up and down without coming from the ceiling or the floor or my sleeve or anywhere else? If you saw that, would you say, oh, well, rabbits happen? <laughs> of course not. You would assume that everything that happens has to have a cause. And if it doesn't have a, uh, a physical cause, it must have a mental cause. I may be hypnotizing you. You may be seeing blue rabbits when they're not there. And if that's not so, then at least it must have some sort of cause. So maybe God created a new rabbit at that point. Maybe it's a miracle. Even miracles don't violate the law of causality because you don't have miracles without a miracle worker. Nevertheless, the most intelligent man in the world, Stephen Hawking, believes that the universe just happens without a cause. Universes happen, although rabbits don't. You have to be extremely intelligent to be that in the idiotic. <laughs> but I understand why. His brain is like a very fast computer. Computers have no heart, no intuition. All they do is reasoning. But you know basic pieces of common sense like this not by rational proof. You know it by, by the heart, by immediate intellectual intuition. Well, if we can appeal to that heart, uh, then we have a, a, a deeper organ of light to cast upon dialogue with, with, with unbelievers. There's still a role of reason, of course, before the heart and after the heart. Uh, let's see if I can find the passage. Yeah, here's his threefold strategy for doing both apologetics and evangelism. Problem. Men Fear, hate, and despise religion. They hate it and are afraid of it, not because they think it is false, but because they think it might be true. The cure for this is three steps. First, show that religion is not contrary to reason. That doesn't prove it yet. Second, appeal to the heart. Show that it is attractive. Make all good men wish it were true. Third, then prove that it is. See, without that third step, uh, uh, without that second step, the third step is not very effective. Because deep down, we trust our hearts. The most famous thing in Pascal is, of course, the wager, which is addressed to skeptics, not to believers. Believers don't like it. They have better reasons for believing in God. But skeptics who have no other reason will very often respond to the wager. And God is not standoffish and demanding of the highest motives. He comes down to our level and he says, well, if the only reason you'll believe in me is this wager, uh, which amounts to an eternal fire insurance policy, <laughs> you know, my, only, my only chance of avoiding hell is that there is a God and I believe in him, uh, I'll start there. I won't be satisfied with that, but I'll start there. God's a father after all. That's Jesus' primary word for him. And a father is very easily pleased by his kids, but hardly ever satisfied. And that's God. Well, the wager appeals to the heart. Pascal says, in effect, we're playing two games here. We're playing the head game and the heart game. And the head wants truth, and the heart wants happiness. So we're playing with blue chips and red chips. If we could calculate on the blue chips, and prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that there was a God, we wouldn't need the red chips, but we can't. God deliberately put us into a world which is a test of faith. 
there is serious evidence against the existence of God in the world, notably the problem of evil. If you don't believe that, read the Brothers Karamazov. Ivan Karamazov is the most attractive atheist in human literature. He makes out a very good case against God. It can be answered, but it's a serious case. God could have wiped out all the evil in the world, performed miracles every day, zapped every brain into mystical instant beatific vision, and there would be no atheists. He could have done that. He didn't. He decided to, to test us. Because what he wants is our hearts. What he wants is our love. And lovers don't propose to each other in syllogisms. When Romeo asked Juliet to elope with him, he didn't carry along with him a battery of lawyers and make her sign a prenuptial agreement. He said, leap into my arms, and God's like Romeo. Well, that's an appeal to the heart. Pascal says, okay, if, if you can't calculate whether God exists in terms of the head, then make this wager of the heart. What do you want? Happiness, a kind of happiness that nobody gets in this life. A happiness that could exist only in heaven if there is a heaven. But you're a skeptic, you don't know that there is a heaven, and you don't know that there is a God. Well, there's two possibilities. Either there is or there isn't. That's the two and only two objective possibilities. There are also two subjective possibilities. You believe or you don't. Well, that gives you four possible cases. God exists and you believe in him. God exists and you disbelieve. God doesn't exist and you believe in him. God doesn't exist and you disbelieve. Two, two of the four cases are correct and two are incorrect. But your head can't calculate which is correct and which is incorrect, so let's appeal to the heart. What are your chances of attaining the happiness that you most deeply want? Well, if God doesn't exist, then there's no life after death, and there's no heaven and no hell, and no one will ever attain happiness anyway, so it doesn't make any difference how you bet. So only if God exists does it make a difference. So there's two cases left. God exists and you believe. God exists and you don't believe. If God exists and you don't believe, you won't attain heaven because God respects your freedom and won't force you there against your choice. He gives you the gift. You refuse it. You don't have it. He won't hit you on the head with it. So the, your only chance of happiness is the combination that God exists and you believe. Now, you have no control over whether God exists or not. And if you're a skeptic, you have no control over whether you can prove that God exists or not. You're a skeptic. So the only thing you have control over is your choice to believe or not. So why not believe? Here are two lottery tickets. One is worth a million dollars, one is worth nothing. Would you choose one sight unseen because there's a 50-50 chance that it'll make you a millionaire? Of course. What do you have to pay for it? Nothing, it's free. Or even if you have to pay a little bit for it, a dollar, let's say, for the privilege of taking one of those two tickets. How stupid to say, I won't do it. Well, that's not a very high appeal, uh, motivationally, but it's something. It should get the honest, reasonable skeptic's attention, and it starts with the heart, with our desire for happiness. Of course, once you're there, God will purify your heart and your motives and give you better motives, but that's a great starting point. I find that in my students at Boston College, there's always a number of agnostics and a couple of atheists, and none of the arguments for the existence of God impresses most of them except Pascal's wager, especially the business students. <laughs> Moral skepticism is our second problem. Uh, the lack of a natural law, the lack of belief in sin, uh, Pascal already was living in the modern world in which moral relativism and moral skepticism was fairly common. Uh, he writes, there no doubt exists a natural law, but once human reason of ours was corrupted, it corrupted everything, including our knowledge of the natural law. Aquinas asks in the Summa, can the natural law ever be eradicated from the heart of man? And he gives a very nuanced answer. He says its fundamental principles cannot. 
But some of its precepts can, if you're sufficiently influenced by either your own disordered passions or by the corrupt opinions of a society. And he gives us an example, the gypsies, who don't believe thou shalt not steal because they live in a society where that simply is not taught. So to a certain extent, the natural law can be eradicated from the heart of man. And the thing that C.S. Lewis warns against in that classic, the abolition of man, can come true. You can abolish your humanity. You can perform a conscienceectomy, but not totally. There's always a seed there that you can appeal to. And human literature is full of examples of very, very wicked sociopaths who nevertheless can be appealed to and can convert. So never give up hope. But there's a real problem. The knowledge of this natural law is severely impeded. For instance, war impedes the knowledge of natural justice. Uh, Pascal gives an example of a dialogue between two soldiers at war. And one has a weapon and the other doesn't. And the one who doesn't have a weapon says to the other soldier, why are you killing me? I am unarmed. And the soldier with the weapon says, do you not live on the other side of the river? My friend, if you lived on this side of the river, I would be a murderer. But since you live on the other side of the river, I am a brave man, and it is right. Hmm. He also says, we, we would like to make might obey right. But that's much harder than making right obey might. So instead of fortifying justice, we justify force. We paint the face of justice on the weapons of power. And if you look at human history, that's largely true. So even though the natural law is there, uh, it's hard to appeal to anymore. Partly because we have a new relationship to nature. And Pascal is quite profound about that. Uh, nature used to be a guide. Nature used to be wise. We used to think we belong in nature. Now due to a number of forces, one of them is technology, another is the skepticism of reason, uh, we feel lost in the cosmos, alienated from nature. Here's a very short but telling pensée. The eternal silence of those infinite spaces fills me with dread. You look out into the vast universe, which the Middle Ages also knew was vast, by the way, it's simply not true that the Middle Ages believed the universe was small and cozy and modern astronomy has opened it up. The astronomy textbook that everybody used in the Middle Ages, Ptolemy's Almagest, uh, said that the size of the planet Earth, large as it is, is only a pinpoint, a pinprick, and unmeasurably small compared with the size of the universe. They knew that in the Middle Ages. But their reaction to it was not Pascal's reaction. Look at the two key words in this sentence, silence and spaces. The ancients didn't hear silence from the universe. They heard the music of the spheres. They heard music, beauty, justice, harmony, order. We hear nothing. We hear silence. And the word space, we talk of outer space. The ancients didn't use the word space for the universe, never. It was called the heavens. It was a positive word, not a, not a negative word. In fact, some of the Greek myths say that night is a black blanket that the gods put over us who are like their children uh, when we sleep. But there are holes in the blanket and they're called the stars. And through those holes you can see the campfires of the gods or the lights of heaven. When pre-modern man went out into his backyard and looked at this enormous universe full of stars, he got the feeling that he was looking in. Like when you were a little kid and you woke up at midnight on New Year's Eve and you looked downstairs and you saw your parents and their friends doing weird things at a New Year's Eve party and you didn't understand them. You were looking in at some great festival. That's how they felt about the universe. 
We don't feel that way anymore. We feel like some Viking hunters in the middle of a midwinter storm uh, around a, a small campfire surrounded by emptiness and, and darkness. It's the same universe, but we're fundamentally differently related to it. Nature isn't our trustable friend and mother anymore. So with that notion of nature, the appeal to the natural law simply doesn't work, even though it's, it's valid. We're lost. We don't know where we are. By the way, if anybody wants to read the most hilariously funny philosophy book ever written, read a book called Lost in the Cosmos, which is about precisely this, by Walker Percy, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist. I guarantee you'll split your sides with laughter. It's a satire on pop psychology, but it's also very, very serious. Pascal sees our relation to nature as lost because we're not proportionate to it anymore. We don't know our place in it anymore. First of all, we're so impressed by quantity and size that the smallness of man compared with the universe and the bigness of man compared with the atom uh, dwarfs our imagination. And also because the hierarchy, the chain of being is gone. We no longer know that we're neither an angel nor a beast. He says man, man must know who he is by knowing angels and knowing beasts so that he knows that he is neither angel nor beast. But we tend to confuse ourselves with one or the other. The materialist thinks we're beasts and the idealist and the rationalist think we're angels. So we don't have an objective natural universe to define us anymore and therefore to define our morality. What do you do then? if reason no longer gives you this meaningful universe. Once again, you appeal to the heart. It's an existential appeal. Pascal is the first existentialist. Well, maybe Augustine is in the Confessions. But the appeal to the concrete, subjective individual instead of abstract universal principles. It's a perfectly legitimate turn. And it's something that happens to every teenager. Preteens aren't that self-conscious. They're not socialized enough to be ashamed, so they blurt out with things that people laugh at, and that's okay. But teenagers are terribly, terribly embarrassed to be laughed at. And they're uncertain about who they are. Uh, am I beautiful? Do people like me? Am I smart? Am I ugly? Am I a geek? Do I have zits? What am I going to do with my life? Well, we're teenagers now. So we need that appeal. We need the, the, the inner appeal rather than the outer appeal. That's why Cardinal Newman, for instance, revised the traditional moral argument for the existence of God from something objective and rational to something subjective and existential. Probably the most powerful of all arguments for believing in God is the moral argument. If there is a moral law, there must be a lawgiver. If you know that you are absolutely obligated to be good, why? Well, if there's a, a, a law that you didn't make and therefore is non-negotiable and you're simply wrong if you disobey it and right if you do, then what's behind that law? It can't be just blind, dumb molecules. It's got to be a will. So if the law is no longer in place if you're in an age of moral skepticism now. If you don't admit the data of an objective natural law, then you can't argue from that to God. But, Cardinal Newman said, you can still argue from something that is the subjective mirror of the natural law, namely conscience. Modern man has a much too subjectivistic and individualistic and relativistic notion of conscience, yes, but you can use that. A typical modern moral relativist says different strokes for different folks. I go by my morality, you go by your morality, let's be tolerant and non-judgmental and so on. And Cardinal Newman says, yeah, you'll meet people like that, but you can still appeal to them. You can ask them this question. Do you think it is ever right 
for anybody to deliberately disobey their own individual private conscience. And everybody else will say, well, no, no. My conscience tells me to do one thing. Your conscience tells you to do another thing. There's no common system there. But I got to be true to my conscience, and you've got to be true to your conscience. Absolutely, all the time, for everybody? Yes. Oh, so you've got one absolute left. Yes. Well, why is your conscience so authoritative? Where did it get that authority from? You're treating it as if it's a prophet of God, but you don't believe in God. So where did the prophet get his authority from? It's just how you feel. Sometimes you feel like killing somebody. That's not right. No. And is that just what your parents taught you? Are your parents infallible? Is that just what society taught you? Is society infallible? Is that just what natural selection happened to produce? Uh, is natural selection infallible? If there's no God, nothing's infallible. But you treat your conscience as if it has infallible authority. Why? It's a very dangerous argument because it might lead in the right direction. Yes, I know that I must be a saint, therefore there must be a God. Or it might lead in the opposite direction. If there's no God, I can't even trust my conscience. All right, the heck with conscience. That's Ivan Karamazov. If God does not exist, everything is permissible. That was the premise of the old moral argument. It was thought that everybody would know that not everything is permissible, and therefore it logically follows that there is a God. But you could also draw the opposite conclusion. There is no God, therefore everything is permissible. Why not? I was once teaching an ethics class, and we were talking about abortion, and there were two very intelligent, uh, hard-nosed, uh, pro-choice feminists who uh, I was arguing with, and I asked them to give me a single argument that would justify abortion that wouldn't also justify infanticide. And they tried to give me such arguments, and I knocked them all down, I thought pretty well. And after class, they came to me and said, Professor, congratulations, we didn't think you could do it, you changed our mind. Oh, good, you're pro-life now? No, we're pro-infanticide. So you've got to size up your audience first before you use that kind of argument. The third new situation that the new evangelism has to address is that we are no longer wretched because we live in a toy factory full of diversions. We're spoiled little kids. We're artificially happy. We can't use the old technique, look how wretched you are without God. You can only be happy with God. We don't feel that wretched. In fact, during the 70s and 80s, they changed the world's most popular hymn, Amazing Grace, to take out the word wretchedness. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me. They restored it in most versions, but I know there's some Catholic hymn books that still have that saved and set me free. You can't call yourself a wretch. But it's very liberating to call yourself a wretch. Because a wretch means what's wrong with you is your own fault, and therefore you can do something about it. If it's not your fault, you can't do anything about it. That's hopeless. Sin is a really optimistic idea. To call a man a sinner, that's a great compliment. Well, the old strategy uh, is not as useful anymore. So, why, says Pascal? Well, because of all these diversions. When students read what he says about diversion, that's when their breath stops. If man were happy, the less diversions he had, the happier he would be like the saints. But is not a man happy who finds delight in his diversions? No, because this delight comes from somewhere else, from outside. So we are always dependent and always liable to be disturbed by a thousand and one accidents, which inevitably cause distress. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning uh, quotes Nietzsche's saying, a man can endure almost any how if only he has a why. Frankel, as a psychologist, observed that his fellow prisoners in Auschwitz 
often survived horrible circumstances only because they had a meaning to their life and to their sufferings. Those who didn't have this meaning gave up and died, even though they had more food and more privileges. He concluded that that's the fundamental need of man. Uh, but if you don't have a firmly believed why, then you can't endure any how that's a little distressing. So you're going to have to manipulate the hows by technology to take away all suffering, because you can't stand even a little bit of it. And that's, of course, us. But there's one thing you can't cure, that's death. What are you going to do about that? Being unable to cure death, men have decided, in order to be happy, not to think about it. See, only the combination, it exists and you're aware of it, gives you misery. You can't change that it exists, but you can change your awareness of it. But how can you change your awareness of it? It's big. Well, you need a lot of diversions. Think of somebody in a car going downhill with no brakes. You can't stop the car. And there's no reverse gear. And at the edge of the hill, there's a cliff, an abyss. Uh, there's nothing he can do. He can't get out of the car. The car's his body. The, the, the doors are locked. Yeah, there is something he can do. He can erect a lot of billboards at the edge of the abyss so that he does not see the abyss. That's us. Look at all the billboards. Look at all the diversions. Do we need all this stuff? Of course not. When we go on vacations, do we go to more complicated places? No, we go to simple places. The mountains, the beach, the desert. We undo our diversions. So the diversions don't really make us happy. They just mask our unhappiness. So what does Pascal do? Unmask the diversions. Here is the single pensée that challenges students the most. Sometimes, when I get to thinking about the various activities of men in history, all the dangers and troubles which they face at court or in war, which give rise to so many quarrels and passions, such daring and wicked enterprises and so on, I have often said that the sole cause of all man's unhappiness is that he cannot stay quietly with himself in his own room for one hour. <coughs> How insulting that is. You can do that, can't you? Try it. See what happens. I challenge students to do that. And always they say one thing. It was much harder than I thought. After five minutes, I thought an hour had passed. Uh, no diversions? I can't think about anything except me? That's right. If the most boring person you ever met in your life was with you in that room, you would be less bored. Does that mean that you find yourself more boring than the most boring person you ever met? <laughs> That's deeply threatening. <laughs> that is why gambling, war, and high office are so popular. It is not that they really bring happiness, nor that anyone imagines bliss comes from possessing the money to be won at gambling, or the hair that is hunted. No one would take that as a gift. What people want is to avoid the peaceful life that allows us to think of our unhappy condition. Therefore, they endure the dangers of war or the burdens of office and the agitation that takes our mind off it and diverts us. That is why we prefer the hunt to the capture. That is why men are so fond of hustle and bustle. That is why prison is such a fearful punishment and why the pleasures of solitude are so incomprehensible. Solitude. The word meant to the ancient sages uh, something wonderful, a Christmas present. What does it mean to our culture? It means the most horrible torture our mind can invent. What do we give as the worst possible punishment to prisoners? Solitary. Hmm. That's deeply threatening. You have to threaten people. You have to piss people off. You have to really, really get them angry if they're unbelievers. You can't just ooze into an eternal growth factory. You have to preach the whole gospel. And the first part of the gospel is you're a sinner, you have to repent. You're hopeless without God. You're desperate. 
The Pharisees were the original pop psychologists. Jesus said to them, I didn't come for you. My message is irrelevant to you. I came for the sick. You said you're not sick? You're a good person? You're your own best friend? Sorry, I'm not your savior. Only sick the sick come to the doctor. I'm the doctor. Well, this is an index of how sick we are, our diversion. And people have to be threatened and challenged. If nobody hates you, you're not a Christian. Jesus said that explicitly. If they love me, they're going to love you too. If they put me on a cross, they're going to want to put you on a cross. Well, we don't, people, we don't put people on crosses now. We just deny them Pulitzer Prizes and don't print their letters in editorials and call them nasty names like absolutist and fundamentalist, our new F word. <laughs> Anybody ever call you that? Good. That's what they call Jesus. Fanatic. Well, how do you get people to poke through their diversion? Is there any alternative to the personal insult, which is certainly not going to win friends immediately, although it may plant good seeds, namely calling people sinners? People don't even know what they mean by sinners anymore, so that's not as effective as it used to be. Yeah, remind them that they're going to die. They can deny sin, they can't deny death. Pascal says, anyone with only a week to live will not find it in his interest to believe that this is all just a matter of chance and there is no God and no afterlife. But if we were not bound by our passions, a week and a hundred years would come to the same thing. Okay, maybe you're gonna live for another 50 years. Maybe you're gonna live for another 50 minutes. You don't know. But the one thing that you know is that some day is going to be your last day. So to prepare for that, to treat tomorrow as if it's your last day is an utterly realistic experiment. And if you do that, very, very likely, you're going to at least want there to be a God. There are very few atheists in foxholes. But of course, we do a great job of covering up death. People don't die anymore, they pass away. Well, remind them. Remind them that between us and either heaven or hell, there is only the most fragile thing in the world, life. Imagine a number of men in chains, he says. Think, think of this image all under sentence of death, some of whom are each day butchered in the sight of the others, those remaining see their own condition in that of their fellows, and looking at each other with grief and despair, await their turn. This is an image of the human condition. That's us. That's good psychological technique. That's like the prophet Nathan says to David, there was a man in your kingdom who was uh, rich, and he had a lot of sheep, and his neighbor was poor, and he had only one little lamb, and it was his pet, and he loved it. And uh, the man stole the poor man's lamb to feed it to his friends. What do you say about that man? What a terrible man, says David. He should be punished. He should be killed. You are that man, said Nathan because that's what you did to your friend Uriah. You had him killed so that you could take his wife Bathsheba. Oops, David repented deeply and composed the psalm that many of the saints say is their favorite psalm in the whole Bible, Psalm 51, the great psalm of repentance. Pascal's using that same technique that Nathan used, same technique that Socrates used in Plato's Republic. Imagine, he says, imagine a race of men uh, who, are born in a cave, and they don't know that anything other than this cave. And they see the shadows on the wall of the cave, and they think that's ultimate reality. And their necks are chained so that they can't even turn around and see where the shadows are coming from. And they do nothing but deal with these shadows all their life, thinking that's all there is. What poor suckers, says Socrates' student. Ah, that's us, says Socrates. That's the whole human race. There's so much more. 
as Hamlet has Shakespeare say, or Shakespeare has Hamlet say, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. One of the reasons we don't like to think about death is that nobody can help us to die. We're not really individualists, we're conformists, and we don't like to think about our unique individuality, although we do like to think about our unique lifestyle, what we do, but who is it that's doing it? We don't like to think about that. But death forces us to think about that. Pascal says, it is absurd for us to rely on the company of our friends, wretched and helpless as we are. They cannot help us. We shall all die alone. Well, better prepare for that. But you can't prepare for that except in silence. Well, then create silence. Because with all the noise, you're not going to know who's there. Finally, the fourth major obstacle that the new evangelization has to confront is what Pascal calls indifference. Uh, the traditional arguments for God, the cosmological arguments from nature, or the moral arguments from a natural law are not nearly as effective psychologically today as they used to be because of a skepticism of reason and morality and the new relationship with nature. But if you begin with death, that's as effective as it ever was. In fact, maybe even more effective. So if you get them to think about that, which they seldom do, it's a kind of a shock. And if you can make them realize how stupid they are to be indifferent to that act where your whole, your eternity, are at stake, that can be effective. Next to the pensées about diversion, the pensées about indifference are the ones that get to my students the most, especially this one. Whether the soul is immortal is a question of such vital importance to us, affecting us so deeply, that one must have lost all sanity not to care about knowing the fact of the matter. All our actions and thoughts in this world must follow such different paths according to which according to whether there is at the end any hope of eternal blessing or not, that the only possible way of acting with sense and judgment is to decide our course in light of this point. Thus our chief interest and duty must be to seek enlightenment on this subject on which all our conduct depends. And therefore, among those who are not convinced, the agnostics, the skeptics, I make an absolute distinction between those who strive with all their might to learn and those who live without troubling themselves or even thinking about it. I can feel nothing but compassion for those who sincerely lament their doubt, who regard it as their ultimate misfortune, and who, sparing no effort to escape from it, make this search their principal and most serious business. Does life have meaning? Does the road lead anywhere? Is there life after death? Is there a God? That's obviously an important question. And if you don't know the answer to it, the sane thing to do is seek. But as for those who spend their lives without a thought for this final end of life, and who, solely because they do not find within themselves the light of conviction, neglect to look and to examine whether this opinion is one of those that people accept only out of credulous simplicity, or one of those which, though obscure, nevertheless have a solid and unshakable foundation. As for them, I view them very differently. This negligence in a matter where they themselves, their eternity, their all are at stake, fills me with irritation more than pity. It seems quite monstrous to me. I do not say this prompted by the pious zeal of spiritual devotion. I mean, on the contrary, that we ought to have this feeling from principles of human interest and self-esteem. For that we need see only what the least enlightened see. One needs no great sublimity of soul to realize that in this life there is no true, final, and solid satisfaction, that all our pleasures are shallow vanities, that our afflictions are infinite, and finally, that death, which threatens us at every moment, must in a few years infallibly face us with the inescapable and appalling alternative of being annihilated or wretched throughout eternity. Nothing could be more real or more dreadful than that. 
put as bold a face on it as we like. That is the end awaiting the world's most illustrious life. It is therefore an evil to have such doubts, but it is at least an indispensable duty to seek when one does thus doubt. And the doubter who does not seek is not only unhappy, but very wrong. And if in addition he feels a calm satisfaction, which he openly professes, I can find no terms to describe so extravagant a creature. How can such an argument as this occur to a sane and reasonable man? I do not know who put me into this world, nor what the world is, nor what I am myself. Just as I do not know whence I come, so I do not know whither I am going. All I know is that when I leave this world, I shall fall forever into nothingness or into the hands of a God whom I have made my enemy. But I do not know which of these two states is to be my eternal lot. And my conclusion from all this is that I will pass my days without a thought and without seeking what is to happen to me. Perhaps I might find some enlightenment in my doubts, but I do not want to take the trouble. And afterwards, as I sneer at those who are striving to this end, I will go without fear or foresight to face so momentous an event and allow myself to be carried off to my death limply, uncertain of my future state for all eternity. The limp soul, the spaghetti noodle. That's not human. Pascal says two neat rhetorical things about that. It is truly glorious for religion to have such unreasonable men as enemies. And this is an incomprehensible spell, a supernatural torpor that points to a supernatural power as its cause. This is insanity. And we have to address that insanity. Because you can't reason with an insane person. You have to make him sane first. And the denial of death is a kind of insanity. So remind them of death. Put some passion into them. They still got a little bit of red blood. It's mostly water, but there's some red blood. And some of it might even percolate up from the sex organs into the brain, but that's where most of it lies. <laughs> that is going to, sorry, I have to say the word again, piss them off. That's a good word to the Bible, by the way. Any word in the Bible is good. <laughs> God invented it. It's good. Pascal thus says, there's three kinds of men. This is a wonderful division of mankind, and it's a key to the new evangelization. Because the new evangelization used to be, uh, the old evangelization used to be, to take people from category two back into category one. And the new evangelization is to put them from category three into category two. Here are the three categories. There are only three kinds of people in the world. First, those who have found God and serve him. Second, those who are seeking God and have not yet found him. Third, those who live without either seeking or finding him. The first are reasonable and happy. Reasonable because they have sought God, happy because they have found him. The second are reasonable but unhappy. Reasonable because they seek God, unhappy because they have not found him. The third are unhappy and unreasonable. Unreasonable because they don't even seek, unhappy because they haven't found. Well, the old evangelization took people from the second category, the seekers, into the first category, the finders. We don't have seekers. We have the indifferent. So we have to bring them from category three to category two. So we need to appeal not just to arguments, because arguments are interesting only if the heart has moved the head to direct its attention to it. You're going to be an expert at whatever you're interested in. And interest doesn't come from your head. Interest comes from your heart. So we have to start there. We have to appeal to the heart. What's the best way to appeal to the heart? Well, I know of no better way than meeting a saint. Once you meet a saint, you're challenged. Uh, students sometimes say to me, there's nobody that's really happy in this world. I say, I challenge that. I want you to go to a certain address and meet certain people, and you will see that there are truly happy people in this world. 
He said, ah, I've met religious people. I don't think they're happy. Meet these people. Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity. Go meet them. They are empirical proof that a happiness that transcends all circumstances is possible in this world. You can't, you can't deny facts. Hmm. More people were converted by saints than by theologians. Now, you can do more than just point people to saints. That's good too. Living saints is even better than dead saints. Even dead saints can convert people. A lot of people. But the best thing you could possibly do to save the world, the best thing you could possibly do to save Western civilization, the best thing you could possibly do to save immortal souls is to be a saint yourself. And that's the meaning of life. Life contains, Leon Bois says, only one tragedy in the end, not to have been a saint. So be one. 